One Hope Church. Let's continue to stand. Let's give the Lord our best praise this morning. Y'all ready? You have come and we have found life everlasting. And now we're alive to know your freedom never
God, you are so worthy, Lord, so worthy of all praise. In the Bible, it says, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you are the creator of all things, and by your will, they existed and were created. Church, I don't know about you, but I am so grateful to have a God who is worthy, a God who created me. Come on, let's sing this song. It was my cross you bore so I could live in the freedom you died for. And now my life, and now my life is yours. And I will sing of your goodness forevermore. 
together, give them the best hand clap of praise you can. We worship you, Jesus, so unlike you, Lord. You know, in Psalm 42 and 1, it says, As the deer pants for streams of water, so our soul longs for God. There's something that's beautiful in this picture for us. This understanding that there is a desire and a longing inside of us. And just like the deer is panting for just a stream of cool water, that there's a hunger inside of every single soul. A hunger that a meal won't fix. A hunger that politics won't fix. A hunger that this life cannot resolve. There's a deep need inside of every single one of us. And I love how the psalmist just simply says that that longing, that longing, that hunger is for God. He said, I just, I realize that just as I see the deer panting through the forest, running hard and stopping in the stream and filling up, that my time with God is much like my soul running hard through this world. Come on, there's so many stressors, there's so many things to be anxious about, so many things to be distracted by today. And when that hunger rises up inside of you, and you recognize that it's not a physical hunger, what do you do? You have to have a place. You have to have somewhere that you can feel that hunger in your life. And it's in worship that you find water like the deer. It's in worship where you find this feeling that goes deeper than a physical need that touches the inward part of your life. It's in worship that you begin to elevate God bigger than the problems around you. It's in worship that He begins to resolve the questions, the deep and wonderings of our soul, the deep and, and just like questions of like, what are we gonna do? Like, God, how is this going to work out? How are you going to resolve the, the anger and the frustration in our nation? God, how are you going to fix this? You know what? I don't know. But in my moments of worship with God, it's when I begin, my soul begins to be quieted. And I say, you know what, God, you've been God for a long time. And this isn't the first time that you've dealt with racism. This isn't the first time that you've dealt with anger. This isn't the first time that you've seen a, hun uh, a hurricane, God. And I need you to begin to quiet my soul. The latter part of the chapter, the psalmist then asks himself a question. He says, if as the deer pants for water, I recognize that my soul is panting for you, God. He ends the chapter by asking a rhetorical question. He says, so then why are you so downcast, oh my soul? Why are you so discouraged? He's asking himself, even though he knows the answer, because sometimes, sometimes when you've been following Jesus for a while, as the storms rise, as the stress grows, we begin to put our eyes there and we begin to elevate the political problem. We begin to elevate the situations all around us and they become our God. And can I tell you, they can't fill the longing in your soul. And so the last thing he says is, why are you so downcast, oh my soul? Put your hope in God. Put your hope in God. Today, as we are singing, worthy is your name, we're worshiping God, speaking to the issue in our own hearts and lives, the hunger, because we're elevating Jesus bigger than the problem. The word worship comes from the word worth. So what you give the most worth to is what you're worshiping. And so if all of your attention is on fear, then you're giving greater worth to the fear, and fear begins to dominate your life and your mind. But when you elevate God, Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. There's no one like you, God. When you begin to declare and let your ears hear, your mouth declare what you believe, you begin to elevate God. And all of a sudden, there's a quietness that comes over your soul, a peace that will help you in the midst of the storm. And today, that's my prayer for you. Would you join me? Come on, at home in the room. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. We recognize that there's a longing inside of us for more than what we already have. There's frustration. There's tiredness. God, I just sense that there's tiredness. Like how many times, how many things? God, what more is coming? And Lord, today we recognize that if we put our eyes on you, if we worship you, if we follow you, God, if we give our attention to you, God, you're going to begin to fill the needs in our lives. And instead of frustration, we'll have peace. God, we just give you our worship. We honor you, God. We give you praise. We declare worthy is your name. Come on, let it turn to worship all around the same. Come on, all around this room, sing out. And the word. Worthy is your name, Jesus. Come on, you declare his name. You deserve the praise. Worthy Come on, snow is like name. Jesus.
come before you now. We recognize that the hunger we have, only you can fill. So God, give us wisdom, insight, and understanding on what to do. But God, we declare today that we'll set our eyes on you. We recognize that our help comes from you and you alone. Give us courage, give us hope to speak life to the people around us, to carry your joy and your peace into the world. And God, we thank you for doing it now. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said amen together. Amen and amen. Would you give the Lord the best hand clap of praise you can? Come on, he deserves it. So glad to have you worshiping with us today. For many of you joining us, maybe for the first time online from your home, or maybe you're finally decided to join us in person today, we are delighted that you are here. One hope, would you say hi to our first timers? Come on, put your hands together. We're glad you're here. Thanks for joining us. You know, there's something special about church. You know, there's something special about Sundays. I really think there's a, a special anointing in the morning to worship and a nap in the afternoon. Can I get an amen from anybody? There's something special if you're not working today, something special about slowing down, uh, just kind of relaxing a bit, starting your week off, worshiping God, but really focused on Him. So I want to honor you for taking the time to be here. I know it's lots of busyness, lots of distraction. We've had two storms this week, but praise God, they surpassed our city, right? Praise God for that. But unfortunately for Lake Charles, I want you to know that we've been praying for them, lifting them up, and on your behalf, we're already sending financial help to feed and to restore, and we may be actually even sending some teams in this coming week to work and serve there. I just want you to know how thankful I am that God answers prayer and protects us but I just also want you to know that we're still lifting up those who are in this who are in this challenging season right now I think we should continue to support them we got some pretty exciting things coming today as we are concluding our message series and I want you to know a few things that are really really important that is next Sunday you know what's happening next Sunday next Sunday we're adding back kids church everybody anybody excited about kids church some of you all the parents are clapping right now. Those of you who don't have children, you're like, what's the big deal? Well, like, there's a big deal, okay? That child is uh, very focused on getting your attention. And it's something how that when you come to worship, your kids all of a sudden have 47 questions that they didn't have on the way in. So Kids Church is coming back. We're excited about that. And then we've also noticed, we've also noticed that some of the team, they're just used to being here and being taken care of. We noticed that we needed to kind of bring the energy levels back up. And so today we brought donuts back to the serve team, everybody. Come on, serve team. Where you at? Where you at? Some of y'all don't know what we're talking about. When you join the team, we have a little food area back there. And for those who come early, get a little breakfast. We've, we've been trying to kind of make sure that we're taking care of everyone. But today, come on, we're highly caffeinated and full of sugar. Come on. It's going to be a good day. And this morning, in honor of donuts coming back, my mom and dad, on the way to my home this morning, stopped and bought me a giant apple fritter. A giant. It was hot. I just need you to know that I ate an entire apple fritter today and a cup of coffee. Anybody ready for church? Come on, I'm highly, I'm high on sugar right now. It's gonna be a good day, all right? So I'm gonna give you about 20 seconds. Say hi to somebody you don't know, a little air fist bump, and then grab your seats at home and in the room. Welcome to church. My name is Morgan and we are so glad you decided to join us today. If you've joined us in person, you can see that our facility has been prepared with your safety and enjoyment in mind. However, church does look a little bit different as we continue to practice social distancing. Parents, One Hope Kids will open on September 6th. However, if you feel more comfortable keeping your children with you, you are still welcome to bring your children in the auditorium or you can enjoy service in our mother's room for moms and infants. We will also continue to share full worship services for your children online. To find out more information about our Return to Kids services, you can visit our website. If you'd like to give financially as an expression of your worship to God, check out one of the four ways on the screen right now. My favorite is text to give because it's so easy. Now remember, our giving is worship to God and is making an internal impact. Also, our fall small group semester has just begun. We believe it is important now more than ever that we stay connected through small groups. 
Whether you're meeting online or six feet apart, small groups are how we care for each other at One Hope. To find the group that is right for you, simply visit onehopechurch.com and click the button that says small groups. Lastly, if you've been attending One Hope for a while and want to learn more about membership, serving others, or connecting in a deeper way, you can attend Next Steps on Sundays at 1030 or online via Zoom. For more information about anything happening around One Hope, you can visit onehopechurch.com or text One Hope to 94253. Well, that's all for me. Let's get ready for the message. All right, grab your smart device if you would. We're in part two of our series on the water. And before I share this message with you, I want to remind you that today we are launching small groups all over the surrounding area today. And so it's a great day to go to onehopechurch.com and find a group to connect because church is so much more than a Sunday gathering. It's great to be at home drinking your coffee or in the room drinking your coffee and having donuts. It's great, but it's so much better when you know that you're going to see them on Wednesday via Zoom or in person. And so it's a great season. The, uh, the, the small groups are happening on every different day of the week. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you can find a place to connect. And I want to encourage you in this season because listen, here's the reality. Here's the reality of church. Church Church is great right now. It's never been more accessible for you to go to church, not only in person, but to listen to the greatest communicators in the world. But the church, can I tell you, the church is not an online experience. The church is not a Sunday experience. The church is you and I doing life together, sharing life together. And when hardships happen in our lives, when you're going through a hard time, an online experience isn't going to show up and deliver groceries. Y'all got me today, okay? An online experience isn't going to show up and deliver your meds if you're going through a hard time. You need people in your life, real people who maybe can't touch you, but will give you an air fist bump and say, I love you, all right? They'll be there for you. And so small groups, it's where it's happening. If you're interested in going to one, you can just go to our website and find one. If you're interested in hosting one, it's not too late to start. You can start a small group at any point in the t- each part of the year, like any day, any month, any week, you can start a small group. But we try to start and stop them and do it together to make it a little bit easier because if you want to break from a particular group of people, it's nice to get a break and then say, we have a break and then we're going to go and start over here, all right? Last thing I want you to know is last week we announced a free gift called Right Now Media. And if you're interested, Right Now Media is a free gift for every single person affiliated with One Hope Church in any way. You say, well, I'm not sure I'm a member. It doesn't matter. If you attend here, you call one here home. You can text right now to 94253 and we will send you the information. You can just use a free resource that help you in your small group. It's kind of like Netflix for Christians. Great Bible studies, great children's studies. It's great for your kids in this season. Last but not least, the most important thing, I want you to know that we are, as I said earlier, sending relief already to those who are hurting in the Lake Charles area. And if you would like to give specifically to that, you can text RELIEF to 94253. You might want to save those numbers in your phone because all you have to do is change what you text to that number and you'll get a different different response from us to kind of help you in the process, okay? Told you about kids, told you about small groups, told you about relief. It's going to be a great day, all right? Get ready, because today is week two and the finale of our two-part series on the water. I almost never do a short series like this, but last week we kicked off the series talking about being anchored in the middle of a storm. I thought it was a very relevant message because at that point they were telling us two storms were going to crisscross over the city of New Orleans and it was going to be a very devastating time for us. But I also think it spoke to a lot of what's going on in the emotional storms in our life. And if you've been feeling just overwhelmed lately, can I encourage you to go back and watch the message and find a small group? It will encourage you. Last week, anchored in the storm. This week, I want to talk to you about fishing just a little bit. I don't know if you've ever had the chance to go out on the water, but just about a month and a half ago, right in the middle of this kind of lockdown season, we all were locked down for months. A a couple of buddies of mine reached out and said, man, we've been locked down for too long. We need to go do something. We need to get outside. We need to see one another. And just three of us uh, with a guide are going to go on a little fishing trip. You can wear your mask to block out the sun and to protect yourself from each other. And we're going to go out on the water. 
And, and that tell you, that was the theme for me for this series because I began to think about what it was like to be out on the water. If you've ever gotten out on the boat before the sun rises and it's dark out and you can, as soon as you get on the boat, there's a little bit of excitement because you're going out to do something that you've planned to do. You took a nap the day before, you got up at two in the morning, you drove an hour and a half to get on the boat at like four and you're going out and as soon as you get out and you're watching the sun rise on the water. If you've never had this experience, you need to have the experience. Smelling the salt water and watching the sun, you know what all we did? We hadn't been out in so long, we started pulling out the phones and started taking pictures and selfies on the boat. Anybody do this, right? And, and just sending it to my friends that weren't out on the boat saying, you're really missing out on this. Uh, stinks to be you, right? Uh, just kidding. I did it. Just forgive me. But anyway, um, you know, so we're riding out there and, and it's fun. The boat ride is amazing. But I want you to know that we, we didn't get out on the water just for a boat ride. There's nothing worse than going out fishing and not catching anything. Now, to help some of you ladies in the room, some of you are like, you know, that's great, it sounds good. Some of you ladies love fishing, some of you don't. It's like when you, when you get the opportunity and the doors of Target open, ladies. And you walk in and you walk by the, the dollar, five dollar section and it just smells amazing. Come on, I don't know what I'm talking about. There's nothing worse than going into Target and walking out with nothing. Can I get an amen, ladies? Three of you are being honest in the room right now. Okay, I've got three sisters and a wife, okay? They have never been to Target without coming out with more than one thing, all right? And so for ladies, think about you're on the Target. Guys, you're on the water, okay? That's where we are, all right? And so we're on the water. There's nothing worse than going there and not doing what you came for. You go the first 30 minutes and you've wet the line, you've thrown it in the water, you're hoping to catch a fish and nothing's coming. And all of a sudden the sun starts getting a little higher, a little higher, and it's hot. It's hot. And you're thinking, how long are we going to stay out here without catching fish? Now, I want you to know on this particular trip, we had an incredible guide and we started catching fish fast. We started catching redfish and having a great time. And by the way, that was over a month and a half ago and just yesterday I finished eating all the redfish. It's a good day at my house yesterday, all right? And I begin to think about what it's like for us to go through life on the water, but then not to accomplish while we're there. Can you imagine if you lived your life wondering if you fulfilled your calling? Wondering if, and really wondering even if you knew what it was that you were supposed to do while you were here. Today, what I want to help you to understand is your calling. I want you to understand what it really means to be a follower of Jesus Christ and that he has a plan for your life in this season. And it's probably a little bit different than your thoughts. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19, Jesus makes this statement, and I believe that he's still making it to every single one of us today. Here's what he says in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 19. He says, follow me and I will make you. I want you to fill in the blank with me. If you're familiar with the verse, you already know the answer. If you're unfamiliar, he says, follow me and I will make you organized. <laughs> Some of you wise got excited right there. Follow, follow me and I'll make you better looking. I'll take that one, praise God, right? Fo follow me and, and I'll make you a better person. Follow me and I'll forgive you. Follow me, follow me and you'll have whatever your dreams and your heart's desires are. That's not actually what he says. He doesn't say any of those things. All of those things are amazing. How many of y'all in the room, show me your hands, you take any one of those. Come on, Lord, make me better looking and give me a full head of hair. Praise God, right? I'll take that one too. Matthew 4 and 19 goes on to say, follow me and I will make you, come on, read it with me, I'll make you fishers of men. Follow me, so become like me, look like me, do what I do, and the process of what's gonna happen is you're going to begin to influence the people around you differently. It's a different answer than most of you thought, but ultimately it's summed up this way, that our greatest calling is to know God intimately and to make him known in the world. The reason that you and I are here is to know God, to follow God, to become more like him. I'm not perfect yet, I'm just following a perfect example. I, I, I haven't... I haven't attained it all. I haven't peaked yet, everyone. I haven't achieved my goal, but I'm living my life to follow the one who lived a perfect life. But in light of that, in following him, I begin to realize that there's a reason why we follow him. And it's not just so that you and I can go to heaven. It's so that we can help others in the process so that we can become fishers of men. So I'll say it to you this way, jot it down if you're taking notes, and that is that we believe that followers of Jesus, we just fish. 
Followers of Jesus, we, we learn how to engage with people and how to influence them to follow Jesus Christ. That's our calling. Now, you may say, well, pastor, that, that's your calling. You're a pastor. That, that's why it's your job. But can I tell you, you still bear the title Christian if you've been following Jesus for any amount of time. And as Christians, we're called to know him and to make him known. And so immediately, immediately when I bring a message like this, there's this, this tension that shows up in the room. Like, pastor, what are you going to ask me to do? Are you going to ask me to knock every single door on my street? I'm not. Are you going to walk by, you know, ask me to kind of become a street evangelist? Anybody remember those? Come on, street evangelists that would get out and they would kind of scream, turn or burn, you know, you, you better get right or you're going to get left. You know, like, you know, this is this immediate, <laughs> that was funnier than y'all laughed at, right? And, and, and so like, there's this immediate tension that shows up. And so we start thinking, well, that's for you to do. And, and I'm not good at it. And I don't know how. And we start kind of feeling this, this tension. So we make excuses. And I understand that there are legitimate reasons why we feel tension there. But today I want to help you to know how and why to do it and to overcome the excuses. Now, I, just for fun, I thought I would share with you some of Boudreaux's excuses. Anybody remember Boudreaux? Boudreaux was driving down the interstate recently and he was swerving quite a bit on the road. He was kind of driving sporadically, and so the state trooper decided to pull Boudreaux over to find out if Boudreaux had been sipping a little too much, all right? And so he pulls Boudreaux out and says, Boudreaux, you're going to have to, you know, blow a breath in this breathalyzer to find out if you've been drinking too much. And Boudreaux said, I can't do that. And the officer said, why can't you do it? He said, because I'm an asthmatic, and if I roll into that, I could die, you know? Well, the officer said, well, then I'm going to have to take you, I'm going to have to take you down to the police department and you're going to have to give a, a, a urine sample and we'll find out, that, you know, if you've been drinking. And Boudreaux said, I can't do that. He said, why can't you do that? He says, I'm a diabetic. I got low blood sugar. I could die. <laughs> well, then the officer said, well, Boudreaux, we can, we can just take a blood sample. We can find out. And Boudreaux said, I can't do that. He said, why can't? He says, I'm a hemophiliac. I could, if you take my blood, I could die. And the officer said, well, Boudreaux, we're going to figure this out right now with all these excuses. You're just going to have to walk this line on the side of the road. And Boudreaux said, I can't do that. He said, why not? Boudreaux said, because I'm drunk. <laughs> Preacher jokes are the best, aren't they? Come on. If you've heard that joke from me before, wave your hand at me. Come on, wave your hand at me. All right. Listen, we've all got excuses. Let me give you a couple of reasons, real reasons, why we don't do it. Take some notes with me. Come on. Here's a couple of real reasons. We, first reason we don't do it is because we didn't know we were supposed to. And this is legitimate. There, there are a lot of you that are new to following Jesus. Maybe you're just putting your faith in God and you don't realize that there, there is an inherent responsibility that comes with following Jesus. And, and it, listen, if it's okay, if you've never realized that that was a part of uh, following Jesus is actually sharing it with others, it's okay that you didn't know, but today, now you know. And to quote G.I. Joe, now you know, and knowing is half the battle, right? Like you recognize the responsibility that comes with this. Here's the second reason sometimes we don't do it, and that's because we don't know how. Today, I'm going to try and make it a little bit easier for you to realize that it's, it's, it's really, it's easier than you ever thought right now, especially in this season, to help people. A lot of us, as I mentioned earlier, when we think about how to preach, we, we have these pictures of kind of people who are angry. And, and my first experience with like sharing the gospel was my dad taking me to Bourbon Street to preach when I was just a teenager. Now, if you've ever been down Bourbon, listen, it's, it's, it's an idea. I don't know if it's a great idea to go street preaching down Bourbon because most people, they're, they're really not focused on a cross coming down the street. That was the old school. How many of y'all remember the guy coming down the street saying, turn or burn, wearing the cross and kind of shouting, you know, you're all gonna go to hell if you don't accept Jesus. It's, it's not the way to preach. Sometimes that's what we think it looks like. And so we don't really know how to do it. And so we're not really sure what we should do in the process. And so we don't do it. Now, I would say, side note, it does kind of look like the street preachers have won on bourbon right now, doesn't it? <laughs> there have never been, anyway, that's a side note. Maybe that's not funny to you, but it's, been, it's a tough season right now, okay? Here's a third reason sometimes we don't, we don't share the gospel, and that is because we're afraid to. We're, we're, we're afraid that we're going to get lumped into some other group of people. Well, I, I, I don't want to be a fanatic. I, I don't want, you know, like, I'm not... Like that person, and, and listen, can I tell you, neither am I. Today, if you thought about the person who actually led you to following Jesus, that person probably didn't look like a street preacher, 
probably didn't have crazy hair like they were on television. They probably were very kind, probably had been praying for you for years. Maybe they were a parent or a loved one, a family member, someone who cared for you and decided that in hard times of life, they would walk you to church rather than walking you to a bar. Maybe they were just, if you really picture the person that, that helped you to find faith in Jesus, they aren't any of those things that you're afraid of becoming. My first experience with God was very much because of my parents bringing me to church, but many of you know that as a child you have these experiences and they're good, they lay a healthy foundation. By the way, near 80% of people who do follow Jesus make that decision before they're 18. It's kind of a crazy number. So the, the people who are serving in kids' church this weekend, the people who are preparing for your kids are making an eternal difference. They're making a huge difference but sometimes we, 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 we forget about what that person looks like. And for me, what that looked like was, was not just my family, my parents, but there was this old lady. Her name was Peggy Richards. And my parents, uh, they loved me a lot. And so when, they, when, when Peggy Richards was coming to town, she was, a, she was a, just a preaching evangelist. She was a fireball of a lady who loved Jesus. And we would have her in to speak at our church growing up. And and there was one time when I had decided because of my experience with people in church that I didn't want to follow God. But I tell you, you sit and talk to Peggy. Yeah. But you talk to Peggy for just a few minutes, you begin to see things differently. Now, Peggy, she was a fireball. I'm a little bit of a fireball. Y'all know that? I got just a little. Anybody know that I'm a little bit of passion over here? If you've never been to have coffee with me, I talk like this at coffee, all right? But Peggy, when I think back on what it was like at 18 years old to really consider following Jesus, I think of Peggy. And I think about how she impacted my life as a young child because the first time I heard her speak, I was just about nine or 10 years old. And later, being a young man, I made a decision because of her kindness, because of her forthrightness, because of her honesty about life with me. And some 52 years of preaching for her when she turned 70 years old. My parents and I had the privilege of going to her homecoming where we celebrated her life. See, yeah, sometimes I'm afraid to say certain things in certain places, but I'm not afraid of becoming anybody else. I just think of the tremendous example she was of kindness and love. Now, she'd tell you like it was, but that's love too. Amen, everybody? Some of you may say, so pastor, like, we're, 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 you're up to something. Like, you know, what's the big ask, Pastor? Is, is, there, is, there, is there something, like, what, you got something up your sleeve right now. I, I do. I do. I need you to understand today that you're in the greatest fishing season of your life. Like, there has never been a greater opportunity than right now to tell people about Jesus. And you say, what do you mean? Listen, when their suffering increases in the world, the work of the Savior increases all the more. And right now, there are more people turning to Jesus than ever before. Why? Because suffering forces us to ask questions we wouldn't have asked before. And there are people all around you right now that are, that are hopeless and they're angry and they're frustrated. And you're over here afraid to be weird. And all they're looking for is you to say, hey, listen, I, 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 I'm, I don't, I'm not like them and I'm not like them. I want to be like Jesus. And I want you to know there's hope in Jesus. Are y'all with me today? Like, there, there are people around you that you're thinking they're okay. They're just holding it all together, waiting, waiting for it all to collapse or for you to share the gospel. They're waiting for you just to be a light. It's one of the simplest things. And so I thought to show you what I'm up to is I want you to understand that this is the greatest fishing season of your life right now. But then I also thought I'd tell you where we're going over the next few months so that you can be prepared because maybe one of the people you love is going through something. This coming Sunday, we're starting a brand new series simply titled Herd Immunity. It's going to be fun, everybody, all right? Get ready, get ready, get ready, all right? It's going to be a fun series. It's going to be a four-week series. We're going to talk about people and relationships. We're going to talk about the herd. You heard? Okay, like that's what's going to happen, all right? Bad joke, but you laughed, all right? Here we go. And then after September, we're going to a series called Carry On. It's a, in October, it's going to be a tremendous series talking about how to live a carry-on kind of life. Some of you are carrying more baggage. You're running through the airport, and people are running away from you, okay? And, and listen, I'm going to show you how to live life lighter, how to offload some things. 
And then my favorite series is coming in November, At The Movies. Anybody excited about some At The Movies? Come on, you got popcorn? If you've never done At The Movies with us, we take modern day movies as parables and we weave a message and you can have sodas and popcorn. Come on, chocolate covered anything in church? That's God right there. Listen, the next three months, it's the, greatest, it's the greatest opportunity for you to say, hey, listen, you're feeling lonely? You need to come to Herd Immunity. Come on, you're feeling overwhelmed? You need to come to this Carry On series because we're learning how to offload some of the stuff that we need to offload. And at the movies, you just want to have fun? Oh, can you have fun in church? Yeah, that's what's happening this next three months. And I'm telling you all that because there are people constantly, they're desperate for you just to share the hope that you have. And so Jesus, Jesus said to the disciples when they were afraid in Luke chapter 5 and 10, here's what he said to them. He said, Jesus said, hey, hey, Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll fish for people. Hey, Jackie, don't be afraid. From now on, you're going you're gonna to fish for people. Come on, think about it. Put, put it in perspective for just, just a minute. Put your name. Would you read it with me? Jesus said to Simon, come on, out loud, every voice. It says, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. And I want to help you to see the season that we're in and jump into it and watch how God answers your prayer. You know, the best Sunday of your life will be the Sunday that you invite someone who's far from God and at the end of the service, when I say every head bowed and every eye closed, and every head bows and every eye closed, the Sunday you bring that friend, I give you permission to peek. And when you close that one eye and you watch the friend listen to the prayer that we've prayed every single service for over six years, you know that every single service at the end, regardless of preaching about money, re regardless of preaching about fishing, regardless of preaching about being anchored, we always say at the end of the service, if you're here today under the sound of my voice and you're far from God and you want to get close to him, this is your opportunity. And when that happens, I want you to know that since the inception of our church, there's not been a single service where at least one person hasn't given their life to Jesus Christ in six years. Isn't that amazing? Come on. Think about it. It's an amazing thought that they're making decisions. But when, when they bow their head and you peek and you watch them pray that prayer, and you see the weight lift. And you see joy come into their life. And you begin to see them realize that they don't have to carry the guilt of their past because God has forgiven them. It will be the best Sunday of your life. I remember where I was the first time I mustered up the strength to tell one of my friends about Jesus. They were telling me about how hard their life was and we were in the front seat of my truck and they were telling me about how this went this way and this went that way and it was all going to hell and hell. And I said, you know, I don't have the answers to any of that. Which, by the way, is wisdom. Trying to figure it out and trying to be God's not your job. You don't have to be God. you got to give them God. Amen, everybody? And so I just said, listen, I don't know the answer to all that. All I know is I have hope to get up every day because of God. I have a reason for living because of God. And what will change all of that for you, maybe it won't change. Maybe you will. And I shared the gospel with a friend in the middle of that vehicle. Changed his life and changed mine forever because I realized that my calling wasn't to be a preacher. That my calling was to know God and to make him known in the world. To live on the water. To go out every day saying, you know what? I don't have it all figured out, but I'll give you what I do have figured out and we'll go fishing together. Can I just tell you today, I'm, I'm pastoring here in New Orleans, not because it's easy. I'm here because it's God. It'd be easier right now to move somewhere in the middle of Montana, wouldn't it? Come on, like no internet, no TV, just move out there, kind of go old west. Anybody want to go country? <laughs> Three of you, all right? He's gone country. Look at them boots. All right, there you go. It would be easier to check out, would it not? But God has called us for such a time as this. God has placed you at this time in history to be a follower of Jesus in this season, to carry the anointing of God. That's the authority of God to change the people around you. Today, I came fully convinced to follow Jesus and fully convinced to push you and, and to open your heart to this idea that you can do this. Matter of fact, the people around you are hoping, they're praying for an answer. And I think it's you and I. I'll give you a couple of truths about fishing. That I think it'll help you today, okay? Take some notes with me. Here's the first. I want you to know that, that fishing really is fun. 
It just is. There's a joy that comes with sharing the gospel. There's a joy with being obedient and, and telling others about Jesus and what he did in your life. In Luke chapter 15 and 10, listen to what Jesus said about it. He said, in the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I, I, I have done the numbers over and over and over again since we began. And, and every single year, it's, it's between 110 and 125 people that make decisions in our services. And I think, God, what a privilege it is. What a joy it is to go to tell people what God has done for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 describes it this way. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. That line is worth repeating. He's not counting people's sins against them. You think God is done with you. He's not. He's not counting right now. He's decided that he's not counting. He's just taking care of you. And he committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's fishermen and women. We are Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. And we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. See, we have, it's like it's having the ultimate gift and hoarding it for yourself. It's like, I mean, I don't know about you, but anybody that walked up and said, I want to pay off all your debts, would you be happy? Come on, you would be giddy laughing like, no, you're not. Yes, I am. Oh, really? You are? Oh, oh. You would have that little cheesy laugh. You wouldn't know what to do. Why? Because it would be so exciting because somebody did it for you. And this is the most fun you can have. I was with my, my brother-in-law this week. We were decided to take the kids to go burn off some energy. And I was so thankful that he invited me because my kids sometimes right now, they got so much energy. And we decided that we we're going to take them to this, the, one of these jump houses, you know, that bounce everywhere. And, and we, we got into the jump house and, and we walk in immediately. He sees a friend of his from, from what he does for a living. They, they know one another and then they introduce one another and then we start talking. And next thing you know, dad, his name is Charles too. My father's name is Charles. And we start talking. And Charles, where are you from? And Charles, I asked the question. Question to everybody, Charles, do you have a home church? Do you go to church anywhere? Charles said, well, you know, I used to go to this church out here. And next thing you know, every person he mentions, I know. And the church that he grew up in, I grew up in. And we started going through the line of people that we knew. And you know this guy, you know this guy. And next thing you know, it's like we were just having this moment. I said, well, Charles, have you found a church since you moved out this way? He said, no, I hadn't found a place. And I, I just appreciate the moment where I got to fish with my brother-in-law because he was like, man, you ought to come check it out. I go. Listen, it's easier than you think, and it becomes fun because you're offering to someone something that they need. I don't know if Charles is watching today, but if he is, hey, Charles, shout out, man. I told you I'd be hard to miss, all right? <laughs> like, glad you're here, okay? But, but here's the deal. Fishing is fun. Second thing I want you to know. Second thing I want you to know. Fishing is necessary. Now, as much as it's fun, I, I need you to, to, to just be real. I need you to, to kind of be honest and really feel the weight of this, and that is that, that heaven and hell are realities. If you're following Jesus, regardless of your history, or regardless of your heritage, if you're following Jesus today, it's because you've bought into an eternity beyond here, that there's something that's happening. And if heaven and or hell are realities, why would we ever hold back the gift of eternity with God? Why would we ever kind of just say, well, I'm, you know, I'm, afraid of, I'm afraid of you not liking me. Well, listen. <laughs> Preaching better than y'all are amen right now. I know. Listen to how Romans 10 describes it. He says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Who? Everyone. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the people at One Hope Church. How beautiful are the feet of those who carry the good news of the gospel with them. 
I, I need you to hear this, that heaven and hell are realities and that is what compels me to preach the gospel. That is what compels me to preach again and again and again and again is to do another small group again. You say, Pastor, why do we, why do we gotta do small groups again? Why do we gotta have another message again? Why do we, why? Because heaven and hell are real. And our church exists not for those who are here. Our church exists for those who aren't here yet. Amen, everybody? We're here to help those along the way. I know, I know it, there's, there's tension that comes with this, but I also need you to know that God is holding back judgment day. Second Peter 3, 9 says it this way. It says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. He's coming. And he's not slow in the same way that we understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. We have a responsibility in this season to be salt and light. We have a responsibility to walk in and make things taste better. Amen, everybody? And to light the way for others to find Jesus. Now, does that mean we have to become dogmatic, angry street preachers? No, okay? Like, if that's what you want to be, I, I, I take back your deputization, okay? Like, I, I, don't do, I, I don't need you to be angry. The world does not need mean people. Amen, everybody? Listen, mean does not help anybody. Kind, joyful, gracious helps a lot of people. And so I need you to understand it's fun. I need you to understand it's necessary. Here's number three. I, I need you to understand that Jesus just asked you to do it. And listen, this one's enough. The other two are great. This one's enough. If God asked you to change, don't you think you should? <laughs> three of y'all. Praise God. We're on it together. The first four books of the New Testament are referred to as the Gospels. There are four histories, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, of when Jesus came to the earth in person. The book of Acts is the fifth book of your Bible. The first four end with Jesus asking you to go into the world and make a difference. And the book of Acts, the fifth book of the New Testament, challenges you. It starts with the same ask. Now let's go do it. Here's the verses real quick. I'm going to read them to you. Matthew 28, 19 says, therefore go. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Hey, church, it's time to go. Mark chapter 16, second gospel. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. What is the gospel? It's the good news that God is not counting men's sins against them, but he has forgiven them and he wants you to have an eternity with him rather than eternity without him. Some of us think that, that hell is a place that God sends people that he's angry with. No, no, hell is a place where people pay for their own sin. And you can pay for them or God can. The gospel is God being willing to send his son to pay for our sins. He didn't do it. You did it. He didn't do it. I did it. But he was willing to take it on himself and pay the way for all of us. Luke chapter 24, third gospel. It, it was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations. Beginning in Jerusalem, there is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. John chapter 20 and 21, Jesus said, peace be with you. Some of you need that. Just peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. I'm sending you. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the beginning of the church, he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You want real power? Start being a witness. You want real power? Don't hold back, Jesus. Offer him freely. Listen, he didn't call us. He didn't say, I'm gonna give you power to be the judge. I'm not, he didn't say, I'm gonna give you the power to be the prosecutor. He said, no, I'm giving you the power to be my witnesses to the world. What does a witness do? A witness just walks in and tells their story. When I was a preacher's kid, I was a preacher's kid who let the world define God rather than let God define the world. I grew up around church. I listened to church, I thought about church, but I wasn't following Jesus. There was a moment in my life when I heard Peggy preach. There's a moment when she said it, that all of a sudden the world shifted. Instead of letting people define God, I begin to let God define people. And when I see through God's eyes, my life changed and I dedicated myself to doing this. Can I tell you, I was the most reluctant preacher in the beginning. Some of my family, they attend here, they'll tell you, in the beginning, I was the most reluctant of preachers. I told my dad with words I cannot repeat in this service today, I'll never do this with my life. He told me since I was in the womb, you're called to preach the gospel. And I told him, 
No, I'm not. <laughs> Y'all see how successful I was. I know we need to wrap up. But today I'm just, I'm asking you to realize, number four, that we were all fish once. We were all fish once. And I don't know if you remember what it's like to, to be hopeless. I don't know if you remember what it's like to feel like you were so guilty for what you had done and you didn't want anybody to know what you had done. I don't know if you remember that. I remember it. I remember it and it compels me. It compels me to live differently. 2 Corinthians 5 and 14 says, for Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that he died for all. His love compels me. So I do, I do this really fun, it's, it's just like one of the simplest things. We have a bunch of these cards and this is the easiest way to be a witness to the world. On the front of the card, it says something extra to show you God's love. To sh- something extra to show you that God loves you. And on the back, it says, and so, so do we. OneHopeChurch.com. So what I do is I try to keep one in the wallet. I try to keep one in the car. I try to get my wife to carry them. If you go out with me and I've forgotten one, we're at lunch. It's like the One Hope Church test. Do you have one of these? Because <laughs> I, I wanna give one to someone in every interaction. I try to just say, listen, if you, don't, if you don't have a place, if you don't know a place. So just 10 days ago, we were with, I think it was 10 days ago, we were with two other couples having dinner together. We had an incredible waitress. Her name was Brittany. We started talking together. And uh, I said, Brittany, you know, things are going great. The food's great. You know, how are you? How long have you been in New Orleans? And have you found a church yet? And she said, you know, I, I moved to New Orleans. Ah. And I said, Brittany, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know, like, are you okay? She said, you know, we've been making it. I said, well, I'm not sure if church is your thing. There are some churches that aren't my thing. Can I tell you, like, I've been a few places. I'm like, I don't want to go back there. I, I get it. I get it. I said, but listen, we're, you know, we're a diverse group of people who love Jesus. You know, we're, we do our best to, to bring hope and life. And today, I just wanted to, to take a moment to invite you. And she said, well, you know, I, I don't know, but thank you for inviting me. And I left her this card, and I, and I just put it there. and said, listen, information. I don't know if Brittany's watching either. I don't know if Charles is watching either. But there's not a day that goes by that I skip an opportunity because I refuse to be a person who's received the gift and not give it away. I refuse to be a recipient of heaven and not say heaven is this way. Heaven is this way. I know you don't have to look like me. You don't have to act like me. But you can just follow Jesus. Start reading the Bible. Start taking steps. I just... I left her a tip that was twice as much as we should have. Because I think meanness or generosity, come on, everybody, right? Generosity opens doors every time. And again, I said, Brittany, if you come to church, I'll be hard to miss. I hope you come. I'll save you a seat. I hope I've done, this is the best I can do. To help you realize that life is more than your problems. Matter of fact, it's a whole lot better when you take your eyes off your problems and you share with others. So we close today. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity to be in this room, to share the gospel, to be salt and light in this world. With every head bowed and every eye closed in this room and at home, if you're worshiping with us today and you're like one of those who've been with us over the years, Somehow in the process of life, you found yourself far from God. Today's your day to come home. Today's your day to invite him in. The Bible's very clear. If you'll confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says you turn to him and you're saved. All you have to do is believe. All you have to do is confess it honestly, and God will begin to change you. If that's you today and you'd like to pray that prayer, I'll lead you with the words. You just say them right after me. Whisper this prayer. Lord Jesus, I'm giving you my life. And I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior. God, would you forgive me for my sin? Would you forgive me for trying to live this life of my own? And God, would you give me the power to follow you all the days of my life? In Jesus' name. Stay focused on prayer just a moment longer. God, we come before you today. And God, we remember what it was like to be without you. 
And so, God, we come with gratitude. God, we come with thanksgiving because of the great work you've done in our lives. God, we're so thankful that you sent Jesus on our behalf. Today, I pray that you would help us to see the world differently. I pray that you'd help us to see those who are frustrated differently. God, I pray that you would help us have eyes to see and ears to hear those who are hurting around us and that we would fish, that we would share the gospel and that we would be a light in the world. God, I bless every person today. I deputize them as greeters. God, I deputize them as followers of Jesus Christ to be light and darkness. And God, I pray that you would help us to do this in this season. And God, you would grow, you would grow your character and nature in us. God, we thank you for it now in Jesus' mighty name. We all shouted amen together. Amen and amen. Would you clap for those who made a decision? Come on, give them a great hand. As I mentioned earlier, it's so important to us that you make this decision to follow Jesus. And if you did, would you text my decision to 94253? It's an important number. I ought to save it in your phone, 94253. If you text right now, we'll send you a link to Right Now Media. So that's a free gift. If you made a decision to follow Jesus, text my decision. It will help you to take some next steps in your faith. I'd love to send you a free gift in the mail, a little letter from me saying thanks for coming, but also my pastor's book, it's called Next Steps. It will help you to grow in your faith. Very practical, very easy. It's really our gift to you to say, you know what, we believe in you. Let us help you to take some next steps and grow in your faith, all right? I also want you to know if you came prepared to give, thank you for your faithfulness in giving. I love being a part of a church that gives faithfully. And I also love having an incredible trustee and elder team that manages finance as well so that as soon as things happen in Lake Charles, we're able to send help immediately. You know that we didn't have to take a special offering. We already gave on your behalf. And so if you'd like to continue to be a part of that, you can, you can text to give relief and everything you give directly to that, we will give to feed those. We're feeding people through Convoy of Hope right now in Lake Charles. And we may be putting together some teams to make a difference. But I always want you to know that we steward things in such a way that 100% of what you give is used to make a difference for the gospel. And we dedicate a percentage of that to go to ministries that we aren't in charge of, just places that are making a difference to give you a tremendous return on investment. I'm telling you, we're gonna get some great stories of how we're able to make a difference in Lake Charles. And so thank you, thank you, thank you for giving. Last but not least, if you'd like to take a physical next step, you can do it during the 1030 service every single Sunday, or you can do it via Zoom and a small group, all right? Would you stand with me? Come on, we're gonna pray over our offering. If you would like to give in person, there are some boxes by the door. You can do it that way. If you'd like to give online or text to give, most of you know how to do that. You also can use the Church Center app. We're gonna pray over our gift. And then next week, I want you to get ready, okay? We're kicking off Herd Immunity next week. It's gonna be lots of fun. We're gonna talk about the power of being together and how we're better together when we do this life in faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we give to you today, God, I pray that you would bless it back to us in tremendous ways. And together, God, we pray for those in the surrounding area of Lake Charles. God, that you would give them hope. God, that you would help us to be a part of their recovery. That, God, you would touch their hearts and lives and protect them in this season. God, thank you for this opportunity to make a difference, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. God bless you, everybody. We'll see you next Sunday. Take care.